everybody, and welcome to Olivia's Book Club, and I'm your host, Olivia Fierro, coming to you from our Phoenix hometown podcast studio, also the hometown of the author who is joining us today, so this is a very big deal, also a big deal to have guests in real life, because you know you know how things have been. We've been living the Zoom life, so this is going to be great. She's going to be discussing her new novel that is uh, one of the March Book of the Month Club picks, an Apple and Amazon Best Book of the Month, a Goodreads Most Anticipated Book of March, so on and on, lots of well-deserved accolades. So before we speak to the author of The Cartographers, I want to let you know to stay Stay tuned for after the interview. We are going to be joined by her mom. At the end of the podcast, we usually do a moment with Margaret for book recommendations, but this time it's a moment with mama, and she came bearing books and an author. So I'll tell you why specifically it's especially exciting to be talking to this talented mama. So let me get to our special guest today, our author in the house. Pung Shepard has an MFA from NYU, has lived all over the world, and her 2018 debut novel, The Book of M, got a lot of love. It's been optioned for a series, so we're anxious to hear about that. And now she is here to talk about her latest, The Cartographers. So congratulations. Thank you. I know you've been kind of on a whirlwind. This is big, but how fortunate to have so high anticipation for this book following up debut uh, um, of a very successful debut novel and I mean this is in an incredible story and I cannot even imagine how much research went into this uh yes quite a bit um fortunately I was a little bit obsessed with maps long before I even started writing so it was very fun research but yes it was months and months and months of um, you know going through archives and looking for because every map in the book is real and so I wanted people to be able to look them up if they came to them in the text and they wanted to know what they look like. So I spent a long time looking for maps that would match the story and, um, you know, would fit. I noticed in your bio that you have lived in so many interesting places all over the world, and you seem to be one of those people that's good at everything, which is very <laughs> annoying for those of us who are waiting to find what we're really good at, but you ride horses, you're a classically trained ballet dancer, and the globe trotting is fantastic. So that's sort of another hook as to why maps or having a, an idea of where you are in relation to the history and the people in other places around you might be of particular interest for you. Yeah, absolutely. And at the time that I started traveling, you know, nowadays I can just use Google Maps when I get somewhere. But when I first started traveling, paper maps were the way that you could get around. And so I really I have a special love for them now, because even though I just pull out my phone these days when I'm on a trip, every time I see a paper map, it reminds me of, you know, the, the very first trips I used to take and how exciting and big the world felt and just how fun it was to open up a paper map and just think, well, where am I going to go today? When I think of paper maps, I think of the Thomas Guide that my dad bought me when I was mm. first driving in Los Angeles and getting sweaty just thinking about I could never make like north, south. I had no idea what I was looking <laughs> at, not ever. <laughs> it was just this big bulky thing. And it's like, yeah, I promise you I've learned how to use it. And I was just constantly lost. But <laughs> <laughs> now, thank goodness for GPS. Um, you sit down to write this book and at, at the center is our character now. And we've got multiple narrative timelines going on here, but she... Uh, there's there's two components that, that kind of launch our book, which is the murder of a very uh, world-renowned cartographer at the New York Public Library, who happens to be um, Nell, our protagonist's father, and also an incident between the two of them involving a, a junk box or a, a box of trash that sort of changed the trajectory of her life, both professionally and personally. So talk to me about these two moments and how this story sets off for your readers. Sure. Um, so... Nell is a young woman who her whole life and her greatest passion is cartography, and it's what her mother and father uh, both do for their careers. And she lost her mother when she was very young, just a toddler. And so cartography, in addition to being something that she loves, is also sort of the only way that she can remain connected to her mother and also the only thing that she now shares with her father. And so seven years before the events of this novel, she and her father are both working at the New York Public Library together and she's so excited and she feels like this might finally be the way that she can start to prove herself to him as a cartographer in her own right and impress him and maybe they can start getting closer and having the relationship she's always wished they could have. But they end up finding this seemingly worthless map in that collection of junk that you say and Nell wants to investigate it. Her father thinks that it's you know basically worthless and 
to her surprise, the ensuing argument is so bad over this map, and he's so adamant that it's worthless and that she's wrong, that he ends up firing her and destroying her reputation. And so she gets cast out of not only the only thing that she's ever loved to do in her life and the only thing that she thinks she's good at, but also loses what she thinks is the only way to have a relationship with her father. And so it's a really big event that happens in her life seven years before the book starts. And then when the book starts with the death of her father, she ends up finding that same map that they had the argument over and that ruined her life in his desk hidden away. And so she just can't let that mystery go. You know, if he was so convinced that the map was worthless, why did he ruin her life over it? And then why does he still have it seven years later? And does it have anything to do with his death? Yeah, it's it's um, a reminder, of course, that, you know, on the surface, we really don't know what, what lies beyond. And, and you can never dismiss something as invaluable or, or, or lacking value because it, it may have a, a another value, a deeper value or, or a secret or, or some other uh, relevance that we would have no idea on the surface to understand. Mm -hmm. And these, these miscommunications and misunderstandings and uh, motivations that are not all there on the surface to be shared at the time with the plot, I mean, really just she loses everything. I mean, she even loses a relationship with Felix, who she had been dating, and, and he was yeah. also kind of stood up for her in this in this incident, and there's they're screaming in the library, and then they're both out on their butts. And they both have to kind of re, you know, re-navigate, start a whole new path for their careers and figure out how to put their incredible education to use and move forward, and, and they're separated as well. So she's got um, to find a new work and has no relationship with her one living parent and then loses her romantic relationship at all. And so there's the, the feelings of resentment and confusion are so palpable and understandable. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so many questions of how do you reconnect and then how do you feel about the lost years when you didn't connect mm -hmm. now that she's lost her father? So I think those relationships just make for such great fiction and great because, because they're real life as well and yeah. even though this is in a, a, a big story with a lot of uh, fantastic themes that are that are out of reach for the most of our lives right oh well thank you yeah and um i mean you know who, who doesn't love a family secret mm -hmm. because we all of our families do have them and so even if the family secret in this book is a little bit um you know different or a little bit darker than your own might be there's always some way that we can relate to that and to try to track down what somebody was thinking or get a handle on where their minds and hearts were after they're gone is so challenging. And so it sends her on a journey all over to some very hard to find places and, and, and places that are even harder to find a second time and introducing her to some people from their parents' past. And it's, it's a very, some of my favorite moments in the book are when we're getting to know the parents as young people mm -hmm. with this incredibly bright, special group that, that all collectively are, I mean, so on fire for the work that they're doing. Yeah, they were a really, really fun group to write because not only are they so passionate about the work that they're doing, but these seven friends are also the ones that they discover the incredible secret that is at the center of the book 30 years before the story. And it was just so fun to write a group that was that close knit and at that age, which is really a turning point in all of our lives, right when you're graduating and you're really, really smart, but you're also still kind of innocent. And you think that nothing is going to tear the seven of you apart. But of course, everybody does have secrets. And sometimes those secrets are, you know, just they're, they're, they're too much to handle. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that they were a really fun group to write. Well, and it, it's that idyllic time where they they're have all of this potential and all of these hopes and these big master plans of a project to work on as a group, like they had been working on their projects through the course, their coursework with their mentor, but now real life is going to get in the mm -hmm. way and, and there's a baby and there's relationships and there's a lot of different things going on. Um, and so it's, it's, I thought it was a very, very enjoyable trek through their past and also how it was going to shape her own future. And I kept, it kept coming to me that it felt like reading Da Vinci Code for the first time or Dan oh. Brown adventure where you're like excited and it's cerebral and there's a lot of things to think about. Mm -hmm. And so it was really enjoyable. I want to know how you approach your plot when you're sitting down, especially with the, with the two timelines and, and in some, in some cases, maybe even more, 
Um, are you plotting it out? Are you post-it noting this? Is this a big whiteboard? Or are you free flowing? Are you taking one <laughs> timeline at a time? Like how, what is your strategy? Yeah, I wish that I had the giant whiteboard. That sounds so much more organized. I'm very envious of other writers <laughs> that can do that. Uh, I tend to, for me, the process of writing it felt a lot like a scavenger hunt where I would, I would have one clue and then I, as the writer, also didn't know where that clue led, just like the reader might not. And so I just had to follow it to the next clue. And then that gave me a little more information. And then I got the next clue and the next clue and the next clue. And so I had ended up building the frame of the mystery, which is the present time when Nell finds the map and is wondering, why does her father still have it? What is the secret on it? And so I had built all of that first. And the last part that I wrote was the seven friends set 30 years ah. in the past. And that's really where the mystery gets solved, you know. And, um, yeah, so I sort of had to go on a scavenger hunt to find the answer. And then the answer was the last thing that I got. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Okay, so the term phantom settlements comes up in this. And, and it is not a spoiler to, to just talk about this as part of cartography. And it was just so interesting. And I imagine that that sort of was probably the nugget where a lot of this came from. Yes. Um, so what is a phantom settlement? A phantom settlement, it's really fascinating. It is a somewhat obscure cartography term, and it means an error that's on a map, but an intentional one. And these phantom settlements can be anything from a small dead-end road that isn't really there, or a little mountain where the earth is actually flat, or a tiny town in a really far out-of-the-way place that no one's ever going to run into. But the upshot is that phantom settlements work like copyright traps, because the only way that your phantom settlement could appear on another map maker's map is if they copied your work instead of doing their own, because if it's an error, it shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so clever, right? Yeah, so clever. Yeah. Uh, so do you know, is there is there a group of people or is there a subculture of people who are interested in this and, and hunting these down in any capacity or lending more mystery to the these settlement these phantom settlements oh yes and i spent uh so much time during my research just looking up the phantom settlements that other people had found because they'll also they'll often post them online okay. or you can um you know they'll they'll tell you where they are on certain maps and so really a good many many months were spent tracking down maps where other people had found phantom settlements and seeing if i could find it too and and these days now every time i look at a paper map i can't help but think there must be one on here too because they until very very recently when electronic maps became the predominant form of navigation phantom settlements were incredibly common and more often than not if you pick up a paper map there is one on that map that is so fascinating yeah. isn't it yes i love it i mean that's one of the fun things about books that when you're introduced to some idea, I mean, now all of a sudden it gives you this little game in your mind mm -hmm. that you take forward in your real life because I've, I've been exposed to something I had no idea about. Yeah, and I, um, I think we all already feel, because maps are so beautiful and they're so interesting, that when you open one up, you already are kind of hoping that if you just look at it long enough, you might spot something that you had never noticed before or there might be a secret on it. And it turns out that that is actually true and that is just one of my favorite things that I did learn in the process of researching this book and something that I will think about forever now when I look at a map. Is there a downside to being the author of the cartographers? And for example, do your friends expect you to give them directions everywhere now? <laughs> or you, you, you're never allowed to be lost? You'll just, it, it will seem kind of strange if you don't know exactly where you are at all times. I, I think that was already me. I was already <laughs> the direction giver. So now oh. it's just even worse. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, then we need to be friends because I need a direction giver. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm always going the wrong way. It's just an amazing, like... It, it, you're just going the fun way. The fun way, the yeah. The fun way. Okay. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about when you sit down to write? What is um, you said? Okay, you're kind of you're kind of on on a trek yourself, and you didn't know exactly how you were going to tie everything up in a bow with this book. But wh where do you like to be? How do you you know what is what set set the mood for writing for you? Sure, I think because my actual process of writing is pretty free form and I don't really have a plan when I go in and it's all just about exploring through writing where the story is going to go, it ends up making my writing routine very routine. And so I'm one of those write everyday writers who sits at a desk, not on a couch, and I have my cup of coffee and I have my big monitor and my keyboard and I really try to sit there for at least five or six hours every day in the morning and I treat it um, 
like a job, but in a good way, because mm -hmm. it, it is what I want to be doing with my life, and it's really important to me, and so I want to respect it like that. Mm -hmm. And and give yourself the time to have the... Because yeah. I imagine there's some days when it just doesn't come, and then there are some days when everything is, is feeling just right, and so you have to carve out that time for 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 all of the opportunity for, for the story to come out of you. Right. And sometimes even on a bad day, if you just sit there long enough, you will start to get an idea. So that, yeah, the time is really important to me and being able to try to sit there for a little bit, at least every day is very important. How was this experience different versus your debut novel? I think I, well, both books were really, really difficult. All books are really difficult to write. Let's just say that. All books are really difficult to write, but I had the benefit this time of having done it once before. And so when I had a bad writing day or I'd spent weeks poking at a subplot that I just couldn't figure out or I, I didn't understand why a character wasn't doing what I wanted them to do, I felt like I could look back at the book of M and say, this has happened once before, even if you don't know what's going on right now or you think the draft is very bad it will get better and you just have to keep writing mm -hmm. and being able to remind yourself of that and i hear the same thing from from authors who have 20 books published yep. over the years and you know bestseller after bestseller and they'll still get into a space in their heads where they're saying i don't think i can finish this one and yeah. then their friends and family are like you say this every time just look <laughs> at all the covers that are over there you know you will get through it yeah yeah it's so surprising how it, that feeling does catch you every time, but we we always do seem to make it through. I want to talk just briefly about the character in, in the cartographers of Ramona, mm -hmm. or it, her her short shortened version was did the friends call her Rom Romy or Romy. Romy? Yeah, Romy. And I thought that she was just a very fascinating uh, little mysterious entity to come in uh. come in to play. Um, who did you? How did you envision her? So she, I really love Romy a lot because she was the first character of that group of seven friends that ends up being so important. She was the first one that I got a handle on, and she's also one of the characters that knows the most. And so to me, she was really, really fun to write because she was she was almost like an oracle in a way. She was this woman that, that knows almost all of the mystery, but because of that, and she knows how dangerous it is, she was the most afraid. And so she hid the most, and she was the most secretive. She was the hardest to find and the hardest to draw the secret out of. So it was really fun to write a character that, that was that complicated. Mm -hmm. And and this interesting reputation in the industry that is uh, considered to be quite negative. And so there's just kind of a, a name that when somebody says it, everybody kind of in, in, in their business has this reaction like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, yeah, it was very... I did that to her on purpose, and yeah. she tells you more about mm -hmm. that in the story. But she that was also very fun to write because she's a character who knows so much about maps and also has seen and touched some of the most priceless historical maps in the world. But then when you meet her, she's basically a black market dealer yeah. for forgeries. And, you know, that is just everybody in the story is very afraid of her for that reason, because just even being next to her can tarnish your professional reputation. But she's so much deeper in that. And. Um, she's just so much deeper than that. Much of this takes place surrounding the New York Public Library, and it just is such a revered institution. And so did you spend time there? Did you what, what kind of access did you have there? Yes, I used to live in New York, and so I would go often and you know walk the halls and just look at the building because it's so beautiful. But the really great thing about the map division at the New York Public Library, which is where this book is set in the map division, is that anybody, any patron can go in and you can request any map that they have in their archives and they have something like half a million sheet maps just available at all times. Yeah, so you can request any map. It doesn't matter how old, how new, how valuable, how rare, and they will bring it out to you and you can sit at the reading tables and you can look at and touch this piece of history. I mean, some of these maps, there are only a few copies left in existence and they're just available to anybody that wants to look at them. So. It just really feels like such a magical place, and I'm so grateful that they have, they, you know, will give access to this incredible collection to mm -hmm. anybody that's interested. That's good to know. Um, we mentioned that the Book of M has been optioned to be translated into the screen or, or, yes. or you know, um, turned into, I, I imagine, a series, or what is the status of that? Now? Yes, uh, we are working on the pilot Ooh. right now for a television series. Ooh. Yeah. And are you part of the writing 
process for that or supervising it or you'll get to see it after the fact <laughs> yes uh, no I'm I'm uh, so we have a screenwriter okay. because TV writing writing a script so is different. very different yeah, yeah um, I, I don't think they want me to go on for 500 pages in a script <laughs> um, but I'm in close contact with the writer and we talk about different ideas all the time so I feel really really involved and he's just so brilliant and I love all of his ideas so I'm really excited to see where we take it oh that is so exciting it is yeah thank wow. you wow oh congratulations um we are in just a moment going to bring in your mother as our special Aww. guest to get some book recommendations and a little bit of you know a little bit of of reflections on you as a young gal <laughs> um I'm sure she saw all of this talent brewing from day number one uh, well she really encouraged it I, I imagine yeah. right let me ask you when do you remember feeling like you found the magic in books and you really uh, you know writers are always readers when did you feel that you were a reader and really get a great pleasure out of, of dipping into a book uh, well it, it was a very specific moment actually so I had loved reading for as long as I could read so as soon as as soon as I could you know string together the alphabet I just wanted to read everything and anything and then I also started to want to write anything and everything and I remember when I was five or six years old I wrote a little story for my mom and I would um, I'd written many stories for my mom but I would I would write them and then I would illustrate them I'd take them to her on you know printed out papers and say here's my story and she thought uh, for one of them when I was about five or six that it would be really cute to take it to her work and laminate the pages and then put a spiral um, a spine in the back to make it look like a real book and so she took that story took it to work laminated it bound it brought it home and then that day after dinner, she said, oh, come over here. I have something to show you. And she presented it to me and said, look, here's your book. And I thought that I had been published. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as anybody would. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, if only if it was that easy. But uh, yeah, so that was, but that was really the moment. It was so magical to see the pages that I had written as something that looked like a real book. And I just thought, okay, this is what I want to do. Oh, yeah. that was destiny right there. It was, yeah. Oh, that is incredible. That was the start of a little golden path that you were going to follow. <laughs> so I take it back. The Book of M was not your debut novel. That little story right, was. Do you remember right. what the title was? It was the very first friendly spider I think it was about a daddy long leg spider who wanted some friends but everyone was so afraid of him because he was a spider <laughs> <laughs> a classic tale right <laughs> of human connection uh, you yes know? the struggle is real uh punk Shepherd, the cartographers it is a great book I actually finished it late last night so I really enjoyed it it's a little bit of I would say maybe um for readers to to, to pull from secret history Donna Tart with uh with the, the best of Dan Brown and, and Ooh, just very I delightful like and stirring it all up in, in a juicy pot. So we will uh, take one moment and get ready for a moment with our author's mama. Okay, I have been very excited about having this little moment. We've got a mo I'm calling it a moment with mama. Hung, <laughs> why don't you introduce your mother for us? Sure. Um, everyone, this is my mom, <laughs> the one and only Lynn Sue Flood. Whatever. <laughs> All right, Lynn Sue, welcome. And I alluded to the fact that it was extra exciting for me to have Pung's mom in because she's not just any person here. She is the iconic newscaster of Arizona. Lynn Sue Cooney was your television name. And I mean, I just looked to you as the gold standard of sophisticated, professional, fabulous woman who just was had okay. such a remarkable career here in town. I don't even know what to do with all those ads. <laughs> I would have put dinosaur in there somewhere. No but way. There was a lot of longevity, but it was just um, such an honor, as you know. It's such a privilege to bring people the news every day and let them know what's going on in their life. And it was a great career. But I'm happy where I am, too, right now. <laughs> I just love Yes, okay. and now you're with Hospice of Arizona. Hospice of the Valley. House of the Valley, yes, excuse me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, doing community engagement. Absolutely love it. But a full-time job could be a marketing coordinator for oh. your superstar daughter. So tell me, like, how <laughs> it feels. I mean, all of this, you think of all of the little moments that we put in to children and, you know, the, the little things that you hope are making an impact. And, like, I'm raising a very reluctant reader. And so oh. it's like any time we can get through sharing a book or whatever, it's like, you know, I've got to bribe him with everything at Target. It's just a whole thing. So, I mean, this is, must just feel so 
good. It is. And I think any parent who tries to figure out what their child's strength is and then feed that is gratified when it pans out. And they're not only doing what they were meant to do, but they love it. It's just part of their spirit. And you see them just launch. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. So I love your Target story. I have a Target story. So when we were little, we would go shopping. You know how kids are. You would know this. Oh, mom, can I have this, this My is. Little Pony? Mm-hmm. That's what she would say. She loved ponies. I did. And I, did. I would say, oh, is that what you want for your birthday? And she would very quickly learn to say instead, mom, can I have this book about... She would never even finish the sentence because it would go right yes. in the shopping the cart yes. <laughs> with about five other books because we really felt like in our home, books were food mm-hmm. and you needed to eat as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Yes, <laughs> that is a good lesson and clearly it made an impact. Yeah, I would say so. <laughs> did you know that, did you think that this was going to be her path? I mean, obviously she was very talented and you had a lot of interests and, and an incredibly well-rounded person and living all over the world. And so, I mean, it's just the opportunities and the possibilities of what you could excel at, I'm sure, are a mile long. So um, what did you, what did you really think in your heart of hearts? Well, I never in my wildest dreams believed she'd be a novelist, but I knew that she would use writing. And there are so many jobs where you can. She could have been a travel writer. She could have been a speech writer. She could have done anything. But the fact that she is building stories out of thin air Uh (laughs) and amazing stories that take people places that they wouldn't have imagined is it, well, it's a little surreal. It is. <laughs> it is. Oh, my gosh. It is just uh, amazing. It's it's magic. So the magic of books celebrated in your home, obviously, since she was little, and, and she published that first one about that great spider that was named... Webster. Webster. Ha ha ha. Da So you brought, Lindsay, a couple of books that you would recommend to friends who are ready to read and just need something that's really going to hook them. Well, I'm not one of those people that necessarily gets the latest and greatest book unless it's written by Punk Shepherd. Um, <laughs> Naturally. So I'm behind the time sometimes, and I have a stack. Well, she's seen it. There's at least eight books in my nightstand. Always. So I just grab. And so I recently finished The Midnight Library, which yes. I know you mm-hmm. love. And I love Little Fires Everywhere, Ugh. which I guess there's a second book you just told me. Well, it's a separate story, but it is. Um, the other one is. I think it's Everything, Everything I Never I Told never You. Never Told yeah. You. That's uh, a great one it's um that kind of goes back and forth with the time too and and uh, also kind of of a theme of trying to learn about what's going on with your parent but Mm -hmm. um you don't really have that information available to you and I think there is something about the mystery in stories that we love and the mystery about identity Mm -hmm. so who is somebody what who are they really like Mm -hmm. Maybe who they, it's the Instagram dilemma, right? Mm -hmm. We want people to see us one way, but who are we really deep, deep down? Mm -hmm. So I love books that explore that. Mm -hmm. The characters seem more real. Mm -hmm. They're not so one-dimensional. I just love it. And the fact that you can change your identity, because it really is up to you how you want to be, the kind of person you want to be. Yeah. Yeah, and I think from from a daughter or son perspective, we put our parents in a little box, right? That they sort of exist only to parent us and that they didn't have any sort of life before we came. And so I I love when fiction digs into this actual human, full person, flaws, secrets and all that make up um, you know, a person that then as a young person you only know in one way. And, and of course, what a great mystery to unravel, to learn, like, who who you really come from, right? Yeah. No, it's one of the – it's that moment when you go into the attic and you find a box of old photos and your parents are – they have this wild hair and they're wearing these crazy <laughs> clothes and they're in these locations where, you know, you didn't even know that they'd gone to New York or Mozambique or whatever. And it just – it's the most fun thing to discover the lives that they had before you because – once you're born, they really do devote so much time to caring for you. And sometimes you don't get to ask them mm-hmm. uh, about what their lives were like before they were parents. Or were too self-centered to ask. Yeah, that's <laughs> Really, yeah. right? I yeah. mean, yeah. <laughs> you forget you forget that there's more to them than you. There was another book that we featured on the podcast uh, earlier in the year, or last year, which was um, I Am Not Who You Think I Am is by oh. Eric Rickstad. And it, it, I thought of it 
with this because as she opens up her father's portfolio and finds this little map that he had dismissed as meaning meaningless, she's wanting to know why he's holding on to it. In this one, it was the father is dead and there was a small little scratch paper note and that's all it said was, I am not who you think I am. And uh. as a child, then you just go spinning down this, what what in the world does that mean? And, and you know, the, the paths to figure out what do I want to know and what what yeah. can I know is endless. So it's just a, an interesting way to launch us into something that we're very invested in right away. Yeah. Uh, I think I have to read that book now. Uh, me too. Ladies, it has been so much fun talking to you. Lin Su, give me like a little tidbit of advice for parents out there who just want to raise a great human being who is going to want to spend time with us when they're an adult. <laughs> you know, I... It, Looking back, um, I would say that I think it's really important to, to feed your kids and um, expose them to a lot of things because if you just expose them to what you like and it's not a good fit, then they feel on some level that they're not measuring up. And they're, they have so many talents, and it's great when they're not the same as yours. Mm -hmm. So the key is to expose them to a lot of things, be very alert to what comes easy to them, what brings them joy, and then just provide a lot of it. And if it's meant to be, ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> oh, how incredible. What was the moment like when you got your hands on this book and on her first book? Well, her first book blew me away because the plot was so mind-blowing. And I think it's going to be a fabulous TV series. I think people will be <laughs> so immersed and fascinated. And, but you never know if it's a if it's just a one time yeah. success. So to see the second one in print and kind of a spoiler, she's working on number three and it's so amazing. Yay! Well, that's the other thing. Yeah. So my mom is because she loves to read so much and she was so encouraging my whole life. She's one of my first readers. Oh, so yes. she's usually read it when it's still in, you know, printed paper form long before even my editor has seen it. So. Oh, that is yeah. so great. And I'm really... I'm kind of brutal. Yes. Although this <laughs> no, but I love it. I is, need it. Is not working for me uh -huh. at all. They're too obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> but she's or usually whatever. right. It's yeah. That's good right. advice. <laughs> yeah. That is so great. Well, I'm so glad that you found the first, the perfect beta reader in for, yes. for life, I right? Have. And uh, greatest cheerleader that you could ever have. I and really have. <laughs> yeah. I really appreciate um, you spending time with us here today. Aww. And congratulations. The Cartographers is out now. And um, before the end of the month, you've got one more appearance in Arizona. It'll be on the 30th at Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale. But, uh, Hung Shepherd and Lin Su, thank you so much for being here. It was truly a pleasure. Oh, it was our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks for listening to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast. I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. Our producer is Margaret Stewart. Our editor is Nick Sanchez. You can send us an email with your thoughts or your book recommendations. Olivia's Book Club at azfamily.com is the address. And you can check out Olivia's Book Club on Facebook or find us on Instagram. Hello, Bookstagrammers at olivias.bookclub and margaret is at overbooked and overdue make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast and tell your friends you can find us on apple and google podcasts spotify stitcher and amazon music